Thank you everyone for coming out today. <laughs> this is a wonderful class. But um, yeah, so Chuba is usually a, a difficult subject to talk about, obviously. It, it's a challenging topic because it's the same ideas that we repeat on every single year. So it's like the same theme just like recycles itself. And then you have to always kind of like find something new to talk about. Uh, that can be challenging, you know. I was listening to a class and the rabbi said a funny story. Um, he said that Rabbi Zeb left when he was he was he was like a rabbi in Miami at some point. Right. right. So he said he apparently says the story over often. He says well, he gave a drush on 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 Shabbos, and a man came over to him like on Sunday. He says, Rabbi, your class kept me up all night. And the rabbi looks at him. He's like, This is not usually a so engaged in the class. And the rabbi looks at him. He's like, What did I say that was so disturbing to you that it kept you up? He's like, well, whenever I take a nap in the middle of the day, it's impossible for me to sleep again at night. <laughs> and the guy just like slept through the whole class. So, <laughs> so, so I, I understand if you need to take a little dozer. But um, okay, so we're gonna talk about some really fundamental issues. Hopefully, there'll be there'll be some newness to these ideas. But um, so there's three parts of chuva that we talk about that we're gonna go through when we come to when we come to Yom Kippur. So there's we know that. There's first there's going to be confession, we call vidui, and then there's harata, which is regret, and then there's kabbalah al asid or kabbalah lahava, or you know the future commitment that I make to myself that I'm not going to do this again. These are the three components of tshuva. So I'm going to try to ask some basic questions so that we can appreciate why each of these are so fundamental. The Rambam says, and many of the other halachic authorities, that if you're missing any of one of these three components, you have not fulfilled your tshuva. Which begs the question, why are these important? Like, why are these such important components? Like, I understand that I have to make a commitment to be better, right? In our society, that's really what everything is about. Self-growth and self-change. What are some of the some of the catchphrases that we find, right? Don't live in the past, or no regrets. I wrote it, or, oh, there's a famous one, right? Don't, don't cry over spilled milk. And these statements seem accurate because if you dwell on the past, it really just is a depressing thing. And it doesn't really help me, you know, go forward in trying to become a better person. So why would Shuva not be sufficient if we if we knew in my heart of hearts that I'm truly accepting on myself to change my ways, right? A person's on a diet. He doesn't have to think about all the burgers that he ate in the past to think that he really wants to change and, and have a better diet going forward. So really the question is, why is Shuva not just being able to make a commitment for my future? That I commit to myself that I'm going to be a better person, a better relationship person, I'm going to have a better relationship with God, my prayers are going to be better. And if it's a genuine connect, commitment, the type that God will know that you're saying is, is, is not disingenuous, so why is that not, is not sufficient, right? It's like, um, you know, in, in a sense, what we do is we find that people are in prison to the point, you know, like longer sentences to the point where they're almost a completely different person, completely changed, that they would never commit that crime again, right? Or imagine a person was, you know, committed a crime and he lost his arms and legs and would be totally incapable of doing anything again. As far as society is concerned, such a person we would have no more concerns about because we know that there's going to be no more issues ever again going forward. So the question we're going to try to address is, why do we need to have this element of regret in the, for the past why do we have to have this verbal confession? The Rambam says you have to actually verbalize it. What is that? Why do I need to? What do I need to say? I, I'm thinking it, and especially if I'm making a commitment going forward, then I've I've clearly um, ran the idea through my mind. But we know that even if I make a full commitment, then I have not fulfilled the mitzvah of tshuva unless I have true regret and I have and I do a, and I do a confession, a verbal confession. So, so let's start with charata. Regret. Why is that such an important aspect of tshuva? So Rav Dessler, there's a famous piece Rav Dessler talks about this. Rav Dessler says that we have this notion that history kind of passes us by. It's almost like it's almost like a like a time behind us, and that the future is forward. Just 
interesting side note, I, I read this article in uh, Psychology Today, and when you go to different cultures and you ask them, point to tomorrow, it's amazing that different cultures will point in, in different directions. Like I think, here I ask you, like, which way would you point if you were to point about to tomorrow? Right? Yeah, so Americans point forward. I think there was a one country, I think Chinese people, they point like this. It's really bizarre. And like some people point to the side. I don't know what that means. But conceptually, we look at time as something which passes by. And historically, we know that certain things have taken, taken place in our past. And so in our minds, it's almost irrelevant. When I think about the past, as long as I can think about the future, because that's really the only thing that matters. My life is in the present and the future. Says Rav Dasso, that's a big mistake to make a comparison between the physical world and the spiritual world. He says, because spirituality does not exist within time and space. And so when I commit a sin, which is a spiritual concept, that sin is evident in the present and will always be in the present. When I do a sin, I actually create a reality. I mean, according to Kabbalistic writings, I create angels, negative angels. I mean, negative angels that actually try to kill me. Really, right? And so we commit these sins and we, we're like sticking on ourselves these globs of negativity. And these globs are continually with us. And they don't go away because there is no concept of time that forgets the past. You know, the Ramchal likens it to the following. He says, think about it like this. If you murder somebody, not you, but imagine a person is murdered. And then the murderer wants to do tshuva. You look at him and you say, who are you fooling? The guy is dead. You can't bring him back to life. A person committed a terrible sin. You can't take away the reality of that sin. So... The truth is, is that sin creates a reality that's not disappeared somewhere in our past, right? Some people try to forget their past. Some people will move away from places or move away from relationships because they don't want to be associated with those realities. And they think as long as it's far off in a recess. But the truth is, it's very real and, and, it's, very, and it's, very, it's very very much part of my life. I mean, the, the Chazal say that when a person commits a sin it actually desensitizes a person to spirituality, right? That's a very tangible thing, right? There's a famous question that was asked of Rav Moshe. I've never seen it inside, but I've heard it a few times. And someone had come, came and he asked, um, if a person, there's a person who's not religious at all, and he wants to accept upon himself only one mitzvah. He won't do two, it's only one. Either Shabbos or Kashrus, right? Keeping kosher or keeping Shabbat. Which one should he do? So we would all think a person should keep Shabbat, right? Because it's so much more severe and so much you know, heavier of a punishment. So Moshe looked at him and he says, tell him to keep kosher. And he said, because the spiritual defilement that happens to a person when they eat non-kosher, it completely desensitizes a person to spirituality. And so if you get a person to stop, stop eating that, then they'll keep kosher, then they're desensitization, he'll go through a, desens a resensitization process, and then he'll be much more receptive to spirituality. And then he'll be more open to keeping Shabbos. So say the Chachamim, that not only keeping kosher creates that spiritual barrier between me and, and, and spirituality, but also doing any type of sin actually creates that reality. So, says the Ramchal, that's the step one is to recognize that sin is a reality. It's the equivalent of a body lying dead after a person committed a murder. You can't change that. And so, so how does truth work at all then? If eating food without making a bracha, if um, being a terrible person in a relationship creates a reality. You know, by the way, there's a proof to this that if you, imagine you embarrass somebody, right? So we know there's a malach that says you have to go and ask forgiveness from that person, right? So what if I went to that person and I actually got permitted, I, got, I asked them for forgiveness and they forgave me? I have not fulfilled my mitzvah of tshuva. Why? Because aside for the relationship barrier that I created and now I have rehashed, there was a reality that was created in terms of the sin that I committed. And that sin is right here with me. And that sin will continue forward. And therefore, I still need to go through the process of tshuva, of regret. Now, so how does regret help that? Say the rabbis, regret is, is exactly for the past. Regret 
cleans the slate. The Ramchal says a very powerful statement. He's, I'll read you the words. It says, He says, when a person genuinely regrets their action, that desire to do away with what you did is the equivalent of removing the action completely. And what's the logic to that? What's the rationale? So I think it's like this. Why is regret on the past, how does that erase a sin that was done if the reality of that sin is a consequence of an action that I committed, or a thought that I had, or words that I said? So he says like this. Well, possibly this could be an explanation. When, when, when we think about ourselves as human beings, we think that we are, we are in complete control of our actions, right? I look at this, I decide I want to knock on this table, I just knocked on this table, right? I want to wave my arms, I want to talk right now, I'm speaking because that is a representation of me expressing my interests. But the truth is, there is an unbelievable miracle that's taking place anytime we do anything physical. And the reason is because the truth is, if I ask you who are you, you won't be able to know tangibly who it is, but you know you are somewhere within your interests, right? right the famous statement, I think, therefore I am. But in truth, our existence is our soul. Our soul is, in essence, who we are, right? That's why neshama is, the root of the word neshama is shame, my name. My name is associated with my soul, not with my body. And there's a huge chiddush in this, because if I'm purely a spiritual person inside each of our bodies, then how does a spiritual thought, of, or any thought for that matter, translate into an action of hitting, knocking on wood? There is no contact between, right? If you're working wires, you, knew, you know there has to be a plug for these things to relate. How does a thought, which is a purely spiritual uh, entity, how does that affect a physical reality? How does how do I speak? A thought is, 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 is purely spiritual. Because non-Jews also have thoughts. And True. Animals have thoughts. So. But everybody has a soul in a certain sense, right? There's a spiritual essence. There will be different levels. An animal has a nefesh. Human beings, we have a ruach. Higher elevated, there's a neshama. But these, in essence, are who we are. Our body is a vehicle for us to express our interests. To the extent where the rabbis say, you almost have no choice, no ability to express any physical action. So what connects spirituality to physical action? God. God allows for a reality of spirituality and physicality to connect. And this, is, this is the kicker. He lets that reality connect, even when we do sin. Which means, like, I'm about to speak Lashon Hara, right? So I have this thought, oh, I've got a juicy piece of Lashon Hara to say. So, who's allowing that thought to transfer into my physical body to allow it to happen? God is making that connection. person takes a gun, and he pulls the trigger. He's actually doing what? God is allowing you to connect these two realities. Different question, why does he let that? Why does my finger not stop? Because we have to have free will, of course. Because if we, if we were prevented from allowing our interests to express themselves in physical, then we would not be human beings. We would be robots, but God doesn't want that. So you have to think about, the truth is I only exist within my interests, within my desire. The manifestation of that desire is purely an expression of free will that God allows for us to exist. And so what does the Ramchal mean that when a person genuinely regrets their action, the Ramam's words are very powerful, he says, Shibiyot HaShav Makir, when, when the person who's, who's returning recognizes his sin, and he admits, and he thinks deeply about the bad that he has done, and he regrets it, such a strong regret, as if originally he wishes he had never done it, and he feels bad about it, and his desire and his feelings are that he would have never done this action, says the Rabban, says the Ramchal, that will completely erase the sin of the past. So now we understand, we appreciate the element of charata. You need charata because we are not just making New Year's resolutions about trimming a little bit weight off my belt. We are talking about erasing 
a past which is in our present and it's preventing us from being able to move forward because I have this spiritual um, blockage that doesn't allow me to be able to become better and express myself as who I can be. So that's the first element of charata, why it's such an integral part of the Jewish process, which is so foreign to us within secular society because they have no concept of the past being in the present, right? Except for societal purposes, they'll put a person in prison because they can't have such a person out in the streets because they might do more in the future. But if we knew, then there's almost no reason for it from a societal purpose. Yes, there's a point where you want people to feel ashamed for what they did, right? Victims always want to hear they're sorry, but purely in a, in a societal level, that's what we expect from people. So, now let's jump into vidu, vidu, right? So what is it? confession? Now we can understand the picture here. I understand why I need to regret the past. Incidentally, when I regret very strongly what I've done in my past, that helps me make a better commitment to the future. So there is a practical element to it. But, but we understand that my future commitment needs to be there and my past regret has to be there. What is this confession that the Ramam says, without it, you have not fulfilled your mitzvah of tshuva? What do I mean? I regret the past, I'm committing to the future. Why do I need this thing in the middle? The truth is, is that confession is a very difficult thing. It seems so simple to us in our davening, right? Salachlanu ki chatanu, right? We do it all the time. We're confessing all our sins. Svardam, right? Every day, three, tw twice an eve, three times again, we do it, we do it at Kriyat Shema Alamita. We're doing the al every night. So we're, we're confessing all the time, right? So it seems like such a simple thing. But if you, think, if you, if you look closely into, the, in, in, into some key people in history, you'll see it's a very difficult thing. And then we're, I want to analyze the difference, right? Shaul HaMelech, there's a great example of this in the story between him and, Sh and, and, and Shmuel, a Navi. Shmuel and Navi had anointed Shaul as the first king of the Jewish people. And this was supposed to be the great leader of the Jewish people. And his first mission he's given is to go and wipe out Amalek, right? What does he do? He goes and he kills out everyone except for the king, because he had mercy on the king, and the finest of the animals. Even though he was given clear direction to wipe everyone out, even the cattle, and especially the king. And listen to the conversation. It's unbelievable. You should look at this parak in the, in the Navi. But I, I wanted to take a few, a few psukim that I saw brought down. He says like this. So Shmuel, the Navi, has a dream. God comes to him the night before, and he says, I'm very disappointed with Shaul because he did not fulfill my wishes. So Shaul gets up in the morning and he goes out to greet Shaul. And before Shmuel the Navi is able to, you know, reprove, reprieve, reprieve, reproach, reproach, reproach right? Before he's able to give him a little tochacha, all of a sudden Shaul jumps out and look what he says. He says, Vayabo Shmuel el Shaul, Vayomer lo Shaul, Vayomer lo Shaul. And Shaul interrupts him and Shaul says to him, Barchata la Hashem, praiseworthy is God. Hakimoti et dvar Hashem, because I have fulfilled God's wish. So Shaul looks at him and says, what are those animals that I hear in the background? And who is this person? This looks like the king of Amalek. So what does he say back to him? He says, oh, the animals? We brought the animals because we thought it's such a waste to kill the finest of the animals. We brought the animals to bring a sacrifice to Hashem. To which Shmuel looks at him again and he says, what are you talking about? God is not interested in these animals. Why did you let them live? And why did you have mercy on this king? So he answers again, another question. He says, oh, why did we bring the animals? The truth is, I was worried. The people had this great idea, and they were pushing me very strongly to bring the animals as a sacrifice. How could I not listen? This is what they want from me. And Shalom Elif tells him again, he says, what are you talking about? God was very clear. Finally, after an entire conversation back and forth, what does Shaul HaMelech looks at him? And he says, finally, Bayomer Chatat. He says, okay, I said. And then you see the conversation kind of, you know, continues off. But we're talking about one of the greatest leaders of Jewish history. And look at how difficult it was for him to accept the truth of his action. That he had to say, well, we brought it for sacrifices while I was under the duress of the people. Till finally, when he's pushed to the corner, he says, okay, Chatati, I said. By Sarah, I mean, also, you see this. By Sarah, it says, when the angels came to give her 
a, to give Avram a prophetic vision, a prophecy that they're going to have a child, even though they're very old age. So the Pasuk says, Vatitzchak Sarah Bekirba, and she laughed, right? We know that she laughed in her heart, and she's like, wow, how can we have any more kids? My husband is so old, right? So God goes to Avram, and he says, why is Sarah, why is Sarah laughing about such an important matter that I've sent uh, prophets or, or angels to give you this vision? So look what happens. The, the Pasuk says, so Avram, so Avram comes to her and he says, well, why did you laugh? He confronts her. He says, why did you laugh? So what does she say? She, she, um, denies it. And she looks straight at Avram, who's telling her from God that you laughed. And she says, I didn't laugh. To which he looks back at her and says, Lo, it's not true. I know that you laughed. So what's going on here? We're seeing that there's this very difficult... We're not talking about chuba here. We're not talking about regret. We're not talking about... Uh, 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 commitments to the future. We're talking about admitting purely that I had done something wrong. And we're finding that Sarai Menu and Shola Melech have that difficulty. There's, um, there's this prevalent denial that exists in American society. Uh, there's, a, there's an organization called the CDC, which is the Cent Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And they conducted this study. It's a really interesting study. By the way, they were studying like a uh, we all know that being obese is a very dangerous health concern. But even being overweight is a, is a health concern, right? And so they find there's a, something called the BMI, which is the Body Mass Index. And basically, they calculate your height and your weight, and then they it's a very simple equation. You can find it anywhere. And if you have a BMI over 30, your body mass index is over 30, then you're considered obese. If a person is below 30, but between normal at 30, then you're considered overweight. And both of them are very bad for a person's health and future. And so the CDC connected a very interesting survey. They called, by the way, just statistically, more than two-thirds, which is 60, almost 70% of adults over 20 years old are considered overweight. 70% of American adults are considered overweight, and 35% are considered obese. And those numbers are just going higher and higher. Right? So we have 70% of American society are overweight to, uh, to an unhealthy point, and 40, almost 36% that are obese, which is clearly a terrible thing. And so what they did is they pulled 1,000 families across America. They called them, and they asked them, how, how much of an obesity problem do you have in your family? Or does your family have an overweight or obesity problem? And get, guess what? Two-thirds said that they don't feel that there's any problem in their families. Which makes no sense. Statistically, it's impossible. Two-thirds say that there's no problem, which means they say there's only one-third, which is 30% of people have a weight problem. It's not true. It's 70%. And so you have this humongous disconnect between people admitting to the fact that, yes, I have a weight problem. So, so we know that there is a problem, we know that there are issues, but what we do is we bury them very deep into us. We bury them very deep down, and whenever we're challenged to face those realities, what do we do? We make justifications, right? How am I supposed to do this? My, my job is so difficult. I don't have time to make proper meals, right? We come up with every excuse. The gym, it's so expensive, right? What do you mean? Push-ups and sit-ups, right? You don't have to buy the cookies when you go to the supermarket. But you see, we have this automatic reflex that when it hits a, a sensitive point within us, we automatically look for some denial. Vidu, confession, is a tool that God gives us and he says, be true. Be real to yourself. You know where you're weak. You know where you're making justifications. A lot of times we do this within our religious levels, right? So a person will say, this is my, this is I'm not that I'm not that religious, you know, I'm not holding on that level. So so we'll make justifications, right? I don't do that. I'll tell you, it's funny, I just had this, I just had this the other day, right? I sent out halacha emails to, you know, every day to a, a, a you know a mailing list. And every so often I come across halacha, I'm like, oh man, I don't do this. <laughs> this just seems unreasonable. 
And I'm like, wow. And, and I'll, I'll tell you the specific halakha because, again, everybody has to judge where they're at. And it says, like, on Friday, I was doing, like, halakhot, like, right before Shabbat, right? So it says, on Friday, after you take your shower for Shabbat, you should immediately get, immediately get into your Shabbat clothing because it's respectful to go to the mode. Where I like to do is I like to take the shower, if I have a little bit of time, get into, like, my sweatpants or my pajamas and just kind of sit with a coffee and a good book, right? And that's, like, a real enjoyable thing to me. So I have this urge not to send this halakha. And even the next day, I was in Beit Rambam, and you know they have to do this halacha after the prayers. And I'm like, oh my God, there's, I can't think of anything except for this one. So you know what? I confessed. And I just openly said, yeah, this is a halacha that we have to do. Because when we're not ready to admit to something that we need to do better, we find justifications that say, well, no, I'm not on that level, and it's not relevant to me. There's a... Wow, we might run a little bit over. Is that... Uh, I'll try to uh, I'll try to I'll try to fast forward it. Okay, um, so so that's the first point is is that the the concept of vidu is a confession. It has to be something that we're admitting to something deep within us, and everybody knows everybody knows where you do this. You know, we all know where we're making um, where we're making justifications for we, where we can be, be better. And says the Allah, it's at that point where you make a confession about something that's a deep truth within you. And, and everybody knows where that is. Like, if you, if you just stop to think for about three seconds, you'll know exactly where that point is. What Hashem wants is that you verbalize that and say, yes, I do this wrong. What's going to come out of that? I don't know. I'm not going to change my life. But this is a process which kind of helps. Like, Alcoholics Anonymous, it's one of the most effective therapies ever, in, in, ever existed. They've done a lot of research. They still don't exactly know why it works. But they found that it's unbelievable how it works. The number three step that exists, the 12-step program, and it's very beginning, what do they say, right? Hi, I'm Dave, and I'm an alcoholic, right? you got to get up in front of a room, and you've got to say it. Well, duh. What are you doing here? <laughs> like, when you walk into the wrong room, everybody in the room is an alcoholic. So you got to stand up in a room for, with people that are clearly in the same boat as you, say you were an alcoholic. But there's, there's a relevance to that. That admission takes a truth which you bury, all of us bury deep inside of us, and when we verbalize it, 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 it now allows us to, to, to look at it. What am I going to do with that? I don't know. But that's a first step that a person has to com come to a recognition of. So there's a very important condition that's necessary for us to be able to do vidu and kharata. And it's based on what the Rambam says when he talks about the mitzvah of doing confession. Rambam says it very interestingly. He says, "Ki mitzvah, ki kol mitzvah shebe Torah, all mitzvah in the Torah, ben asev and lot asev, whether they're positive or negative commandments. Im avar adam al achad mehem, if a person uh, failed to commit one of them, whether it was on purpose, whether it was by mistake, ki sheyaseh teshuva, when he does this process, we call teshuva, v'yashiv mechato, and he returns from his sin, lihitvadot, he must make a confession, lifnei hakel baruchu." He must make a confession in front of God. And then he repeats it later. Later, he says, How does a person make this confession? He says, Ana Hashem, please God. Khatati, I've sinned. Aviti, I've done it. Uh, I've done it willingly. Shati, I did it in spite of you. Vasiti, kach, vakach. You need to specify what you did. But it's interesting, it says, Pashati, lefanecha. In front of you. And this you see this throughout the Rambam. That in every time he talks about vidu or confession, he always talks about making a confession in front of God. And what is that relevance? What's a, why, why is that important? And I think that this is a key factor in what makes the difference between our empty confessions that we make three times a day, for Sparta, 18 times a day, right? Because we're not talking to anyone. The Rambam's emphasizing vidu works when there's somebody in the room. When you've committed a crime or you've hurt someone's feelings, how easy is it for you to, let's say you get in an argument with someone and then you say a really nasty line, right? And you feel really bad, right? You feel guilty about it. So what do you do? You walk into the other room, you lock the door, and you're like, you know, I'm really so sorry about what I did. You know, like, it's so not me. I, I, I shouldn't have hurt your feelings. What would you say? The guy's moronic. What are you doing? 
You're not talking to anybody. There's no value to a confession when there's nobody in the room. You know, you find this also, and we're all, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this, right? Before Hashanah Yom Kippur, what do we do? Like, we know there's somebody that we really slighted. And we know that Yom Kippur is only Mechaper if I ask the person to forgive me. So what we do is we send this generic emails. They're like, please forgive me for anything I've done, right? Because complete avoidance of any sensitivity that I'm actually talking to somebody because, well, if he knows, if I engage him to the point where he knows I'm talking to him, so we word the emails in such a, like, we'll either keep a lot of people on the email or it's so generic that the person should not get the slightest doubt that I'm actually talking to him. Lifnei Hashem is a requirement that a person has to know that when you're confessing, you have to think that there's somebody there that you're talking to. <clears throat> and that's why we have such a difficult time. You know, the Ashkenazim took the vidui out of the sitter. I don't know if they took it out of the sitter, but the Svarim have it in the sitter and the Ashkenazim don't, right? After Mincha, after Shachars, we're doing this all day. Why, did they, why is it not an Ashkenazim sitter? Because the, whoever at the time found that they were becoming so desensitized to this thing that they're like, wow, we got to take it. It cannot be in the sitter. Let's put it on like uh, Erev Yom Kippur. Now, all of a sudden, you know, like that feeling like, oh no. But still, even then, it has to be Lifnei Hashem. So how do we do this? I'm going to give a couple practical points and then, and then we'll stop. How do, we, how do we make this reality of Lifnei Hashem, right? How do we avoid this, avoid conflict syndrome and try to do everything in silence, right? It's, it's, it's humorous to think that we can get in a fight with our wife and then apologize in our car on the way to work. We think that's silly, yet we do that every single day because there's nobody present. So we're not really fulfilling the mitzvah of vidu, vidu until we can have this dialogue that there's actually somebody on the other side. So the first way of doing this, the Ramchal says in the Sils Sharm, he says, you have to work with visualization. You have to close your eyes at times, and you have to actually think you're in the presence of somebody. You know, they say you should do this at the beginning of Shemar Esrei. Personally, what I do on, on Rosh Hashanah, you know, I can't do this too often, but like on Rosh Hashanah, like I'm standing like, you know, before we're about to enter into the into this Amida and everyone's quiet and it's like a very heavy moment. I close my eyes and then I, I imagine like there's a lady with like a checklist. She's like, Mr. John Gramazin, please step forward to the judge, right? My eyes are closed. And I'm thinking like I'm in this huge, there's huge doors in front of me. And then the doors slowly open and I'm walk, I'm stepping into the Shemar right? I'm walking in. And all of a sudden there's like this enormous room. And there's a huge judge table, and he's sitting there. Well, you can't visualize God, but imagine there's, there's a being there. When you visualize something, you actually are experiencing, scientifically they found, by the way, if you look at your hand, and then you close your eyes, and then you imagine your hand, the same part of your brain is accessed in both of those experiences. So... Imagining something is the equivalent of seeing it because they both take place within your visual cortex, right? They do. They tell people if you have a fear of uh, public speaking, imagine yourself going through this process of going on this, preparing the speech, going on the stage, having the everyone in front of you. When you imagine going through a scenario, it's the equivalent of actually having experienced it, and that's a very good piece of advice for difficult things we need to overcome, but I think it's a very powerful tool, like the Ramchal says, that if a person wants to get into the mode of a proper vidu, a proper confession, it has to be lifne. It has to be in front of somebody. Um, and then I'll just end with, I'll end with the last point here, just to make it a little bit easier also, to how do we, how do we tap into that emotion? So first we need to visualize, and the second one is that, I'll say quickly that um, Revol Revolva says, that we, re, we say in the Haggadah very strange thing. It says, we say Dayenu, right? And one of the Dayenus is, is that had God just brought us to Har Sinai, but not given us the Torah, that would have been sufficient. So everybody asks the question, what does that mean? What was the point of going out of Mitzrayim, going through the desert, coming to the mountain, and God saying, all right, that's enough, guys. We've done it. How is that sufficient? And so he said, beautiful thing. says Rehobah, the truth is, is that the most important thing that took place at Kabbalah Satora was the is my watch oh my watch is behind probably. Okay. okay. Yeah. If, if, if 
he says like this. He says, by Kabbalah Satora, the most important aspect of that event was the relationship that we had forged with Hashem right before we received the Torah. The Jews were on such an emotional level, connected to each other, connected to Hashem. Says Rav Oba, why did God give the Torah after that? Because he wanted us to know how to keep that relationship alive. That every mitzvah was an outgrowth of some aspect of the relationship that we have with Hashem. That's a beautiful idea. So I think that another piece of, uh, another good idea is for us to sometimes, we get caught in the details of the sins that we do. And then, you know, in a sense we're like, why is that such a big deal? Like, so I didn't make a bracha chrona. So what? Or, uh, I was a little bit late for, for prayers. Or, I, you know, all of the things that we think are so, so finite and so much minutia, if we are always zeroed in on the, on the specificity of that, we'll have a hard time relating to it on an emotional level. And what a, a good piece of advice I read was that if you just zone out and try to find out what is the deeper concept that's being expressed by this mitzvah, you can tap into emotions very easily. So I just want to put a couple examples of that. By the way, the Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu, those that we read, did you ever read them and wonder, like, what, what the heck are, are these even talking about? Ashamnu, Bagadnu? It doesn't say, ate without a bracha, do all these. By the way, the Svartim have the Vidu Yagadu, which is a great thing to go through right before Rosh Hashanah. It actually lists every sin possible. It's like 20 pages by the olive base. It's kind to go through because you're like, wow, that's a sin? Right? You can't believe it. But the Ashamnu seems so general. And the reason is, is because they have to be general because if we tap into the bigger picture of what's wrong with what we're doing, then we can tap into the emotion. So just a couple examples is for chukim, right? Chukim are like sins that we don't relate to. Like, you know, one is, you know, uh, immorality, illicit relationships, stuff, stuff like that, that there's no rationale that God necessarily gave to it. Of course, we can find reasons for it. Then you can tap into an emotion which is broader that I should fear the punishment that's a consequence of this. And so when you're standing in front of that judge, you have to be have a fear that this is going to cause me a punishment. And that can help you have a regret in the past for what you did. Another one is, is lack of gratitude. You know, we have a hard time thinking, okay, I was late for davening, I missed davening, I made a bracha, I didn't make a bracha. A lot of things which have to do with gratitude to God, if we were to step back and think like, I'm so ungrateful to God. He gives me so much in my life and this is how I repay him, then you can tap into an emotion and say like, yeah, making a bracha is a problem. Because in the core of it, it's representing a relationship that I have now been defunct in. And so, so just to quickly summarize, because we said a lot of ideas and you can run to Marv. So we started with a question that, why do we need charata, vidue, and, and kabbalah, right? Why do you have to have uh, admission, you have to have regret, and you have to have, it should be sufficient, like we say in American society, is don't cry over spilled milk, right? Everybody says, don't live in the past. It only draws you down. So we said from Rav Dessler that sin is not historical past. He says spirituality doesn't have time. And if spirituality doesn't have time, then sin committed is sin in the present. And it will stay with me as I go forward. And it affects everything about my life in terms of my spiritual sensitivities about what I'm doing forward. So he says, if sin is the equivalent of creating a reality, the equivalent of shooting a person being dead, so then how does tshuva repair that? You've created this, this situation. And so says the Ramchal, when you, when you undo your, your desire for that sin that you committed, when you regret having done it, and you remove your, your, your emotions, your, your ratzon, he says that it's as if you never committed that action. And we said the reason is because we are purely spiritual beings. And the connection of spirituality to physicality is a miracle. I think to knock on this table, but the fact that I knock on the table makes no sense because how does a spiritual thought affect a physical body? That's what God allows to happen. So we really only exist within our thoughts. And therefore, if a person thinks back and they regret truly an action, then they're in essence removing themselves from that action, and then it's no longer them that committed that sin. And that's why it can be wiped away. So that's karata. Why a charet is relevant? Because the past is relevant in Judaism. It's not just about the future. And then confession, we said, confession seems so simple. That's because we are not talking to anybody. Or we're in denial of the things that we need to change about our lives. Denial is a hard thing to accept, like Shalom Aleph and Sarai Menu. But if a person is honest with themselves, then you can ask yourselves those questions. Where am I fooling myself? And don't, you don't have to be afraid of changing it. You just have to make the verbalization of that point. 
And how can we do that? We can do that by... Um, the Rambam says you have to realize you're talking to somebody. Vidu has to be in front of Lifnei Hashem. If God is not in front of you, then we can do this all day long, and it really doesn't strike a chord. We can send those mass emails, we can do everything we want. So, and then to, to zero in, how do we do it? Visualization. Thinking about the process, thinking about standing in front of God, thinking about a relationship that I hurt, thinking about a person in pain. All of those visualizations can actually help us elicit stronger emotions of ingratitude that I have for God, or the fear of punishment that I'm going to have from God, by being engaged in that relationship. And the last piece of advice, and I do this all the time, I think that the car, I've said this to you before, I think the car is the greatest inner sanctuary for the greatest tshuva. Yeah, shul is good, and diving to Hashem is good and everything. But when you're alone in your car, and you shut everything down, you have this closed, closed opportunity just to talk. So over the next few weeks, take time to turn everything off and just talk to God. It's an awkward thing, but you might actually realize that there is somebody there. And you can, you can bring so much more out in terms of that relationship.